uh, I'm delighted to introduce um, uh, Dr. Joshua White, who's Associate Professor of History at the University of Virginia, uh, as our speaker this evening. Um, uh, Joshua um, studies and teaches the history of the medieval and early modern uh, Mediterranean uh, and Middle East with a particular uh, focus on the social, legal and diplomatic history of the early modern Ottoman Empire. His current book project entitled Catch and Release, Piracy, Slavery and Law in the Early Modern Ottoman Empire will be uh, the source of his talk this evening. Um, and uh, uh, we very much look forward to that. Uh, he's fairly lived and, and studied uh, in many places, um, Egypt, Greece, Israel, Italy, Morocco, the UK, and of course, Turkey. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome uh, Joshua White uh, and to share your screen. And afterwards, um, I will sort of uh, invite you to comment or ask questions. Um, but uh, Joshua, the floor is yours. Thank you, Quentin, for that introduction. Um, and thank you all for coming. Um, good evening, good afternoon, uh, depending on where you are. Uh, so it's a, it's a real delight to be able to speak uh, with you all today um, about my uh, first book, which uh, next month will turn four, so it's about ready to go to preschool. And uh, what my intention is for today is to start by defining some terms. Then we'll get into some of the historical background of uh, maritime violence of the late 15th and 16th centuries. And that will take us into the world of piracy and law in the Ottoman Mediterranean in the late 16th and 17th centuries, which is really the subject of my book. Um, so let's begin here first by getting into where Jihad Island is. Jihad Island is not a place that exists um, on the map. It's more in your heart and in your mind. Um, we are coming here from the words of Mustafa Ali, a well-known bureaucrat and historian um, and public commentator of the uh, later 16th century, um, who wrote as he was describing the pirates and corsairs of the Mediterranean of his era and the great disorder that then had seized it. Um, he said, think of jihad as an island. On its right is a sea of wealth. On the left is corruption. Um, he's talking here about maritime raiding and he's telling you effectively that we're dealing with two sides of the same activity, both of which are potentially remunerative, but one is endorsed by the faith and the state, and the other is a criminal act. Um, the more common metaphor is when we talk of piracy and corsairing as two sides of the same coin, but I think actually the island metaphor is a better one because as you're going around that circle, going around the island, sailing it, you're dealing with changing currents, the winds might shift at any moment against you, and on one side of the island, depending on the weather, you might find shelter, and on the other side, be exposed to violent storms. This is certainly true of the perpetrators of maritime violence in the Mediterranean world of the quote unquote early modern period. So we'll say from the 16th through the 18th centuries, who at one moment might well be engaged in activities that were endorsed by their political masters and receive rewards well exceeding those that they took from the ships and the shores that they raided. Um, and the other be condemned as criminal rebels, um, as violent apostates, uh, and be subject to uh, really far less pleasant outcome. And the reality is that one could find oneself on the wrong side of Jihad Island quite easily, not just at different points of one's career, but on the very same cruise. Um, so what we're talking here then, broadly speaking, is about piracy versus corsairing. Um, the definitions of those two things as would be given by European jurists of the 16th and 17th centuries and the understandings are broadly speaking shared by the Ottomans of the same period is that the pirate takes stuff by sea without justification or authorization 
and does not discriminate in his targeting. Um, the privateer does much the same thing, but in the context of war and with license from a sovereign. That is to say, the targeting is supposed to be rather more specific. The Corsair is, broadly speaking, the same thing as the privateer, but in the context of the Mediterranean, the targeting usually has a religious dimension as well. That is to say, broadly speaking, we are talking about Muslims targeting Christians and Christians targeting Muslims. Um, there's an important extra distinction to add here, though, which is Corsairing is a profession. This is a profession in which people are engaged. Piracy is an act. So the question of who, what, or when is a pirate is one that is being determined by law, law not determined by those practicing piracy, mind you, um, and by effectively political actors more so than it is by the nature of what they're doing, right? Again, corsairing and piracy, the line between those two things is one that is usually being determined on land, not at sea. Um, Lauren Benton has talked about pirates as lawyers um, in the sense that those engaged in the profession of maritime raiding or those who are not engaged in the profession of it but dabble in it opportunistically will usually be looking for ways to justify their actions. That is to say, in the world of the Mediterranean in this period, nobody wants to be a pirate. There is no honor or joy or pride to be found in being called a pirate. Everybody's looking for ways to justify their actions, either to political authorities or to their communities, preferably both. Now, corsairing is big business. It is entirely legitimate, at least in the ports where it is sponsored. And so even though it is rather common for writers of today to describe the corsairs of the Mediterranean as pirates, and certainly often for their victims to have described uh, their attackers as pirates. Um, it's not really piracy. Um, Corsairs were based out of many of the major ports in the Mediterranean and quite a few minor ones as well, and it was conducted entirely in the open. So Algiers, Tunis, and Tripoli in North Africa, Malta, Livorno, all famous capitals of Corsairing in the 16th and 17th and 18th centuries. Um, what are Corsairs after, by and large? Well, certainly uh, food is among the most important forms of booty that are being sought. If any uh, among you are more co uh, commonly familiar, perhaps, with the piracy of the Caribbean, uh, or fans of the various uh, movies focused on that environment, Right. We're not talking about ships filled with gold doubloons here. We are talking about ships rather filled with grain, honey, olive oil, salt, things like that, which are of great value and, and deep importance, especially given how prevalent famine is in the Mediterranean this period. But by far the most important booty sought by corsairs is of the human variety. Um, captives are above all the most valuable thing to be sought in the Mediterranean in this period. And they are sought, broadly speaking, for two purposes. Captives can be held for ransom, and captives can be used as slaves, whether as domestic servants or, in particular, as oarsmen. When we're talking about the 16th century in particular, right, we are still dealing with warfare practice primarily with galleys, which require and consume oarsmen at truly horrific rates. And so what we often find effectively is that the corsairing industry and naval warfare more broadly have to keep grabbing people in order to actually be able to remain in motion. That they consume humans so quickly that the mortality rate is so high on the galleys that they must constantly be seizing people in order to keep their navies at sea. Um, those things are of course not mutually exclusive. One can, can be captured, employed, used as a slave, and still be ultimately ransomed. Um, and again, this is a really important part of the Mediterranean economy of this period, one which is central to the self-definition and the economies of many of the ports of the era, both in the Northern Mediterranean and the South. So I show you first here um, a statue erected in 1626 in Livorno. Um, at the top of the pedestal 
understands uh, the Grand Duke of Tuscany. We don't need to look at him. Let's look at what's going on below. He is asserting his sovereignty in part by decorating his statue with enchained Muslim captives, right? People who might be ultimately forced to work on the ore or be ransomed or both, right? Um, likewise, in Algiers, famously, much of the economy is based around the corsairing industry, in particular, uh, the ransoming back of captives. And this is something that it employs far more than just the corsairs. If we think about the infrastructure needed in order to house and feed them, and then to conduct the transactions that transport money from one end of the Mediterranean to the other safely, and then the captives back again safely. It's, this requires trust between enemies. It requires very sophisticated financial instruments. This is a huge business, right? Um, and of course, uh, for the Ottomans in particular, the corsairing industry um, is one of the ways in which the Ottoman Empire is supplied with slaves, that the Ottoman Empire through the 18th century, indeed through the end of the empire itself, has an enormous demand for captives. That in particular, because slavery in the Ottoman Empire is widely practiced in, in, in mostly the domestic context, far less so for agricultural purposes or what have you. And that slavery is usually a single generation experience, one not typically inherited by children. Um, and because manumission is extremely common, many of the enslaved would be freed after some number of years of service. There is tremendous demand. And so while the Ottomans feed that hunger for captives in part through war, um, in part through Tatar raiding, uh, Corsairs too supply the market with much of what it demands. Um, now, when we speak then of maritime violence in the Mediterranean in the early modern period, we can speak broadly speaking of kind of three major phases. The first wave begins in the final decades of the 15th century. Um, and I'm retelling here now a fairly well-known narrative and some of you might be quite familiar with it. Um, but broadly speaking, it goes as follows, that the advance of the Spanish Reconquista um, ends up crossing the Mediterranean itself and advancing across North Africa, that the expulsion of the Jews and subsequently uh, the driving out of many Muslims uh, create a refugee crisis and drive a whole bunch of these Iberian refugees into the North African capitals, which are under siege by the Spanish, and that those local North African dynasts then license corsairs to operate against the Spanish to protect themselves and to enrich themselves, and that they can then get manpower both from Iberian exiles and attract manpower from adventurers from the Eastern Mediterranean. And if we consider at the same time as this, the Knights of St. John, um, the Hospitallers, are based on roads with also territory on Anatolian mainland itself at Bodrum, and are themselves engaged in the profession of corsairing, of raid and Muslim shipping. Uh, those fighting against them within the Eastern Mediterranean include plenty of Turkish corsairs, two people who often began their careers effectively, as Mustafa Ali will tell us, as pirates, but then graduated into something rather more legitimate in fighting back against the Knights of Rhodes. But in time, as we near the end of the 15th century, those adventurers see that where the real action is going to be is in the Western Mediterranean, raiding in particular Spanish possessions. Um, so that's kind of the first wave. Now, the stakes increase thanks in part to the inbreeding of the Habsburgs, right? The fact that Charles V will inherit both the lands of the Holy Roman Empire and the United Crowns of Spain lead the fact then to, to the Ottomans fighting him both on land within Central Europe and at sea in the Mediterranean. And so a, a battle that might have been then uh, really on the edges of Ottoman interest in the Mediterranean, that is to say over the fate of Western North Africa, becomes one linked to this battle for imperial sovereignty and for uh, really who gets to claim to be a world sovereign. Um, 
those Corsairs who had been bloodied in the West fighting against the Spanish are then those who will be drawn in to the next wave of direct conflict between Spain and the Ottomans over the course of the middle decades of the 16th century. This then, after having left behind our first wave of, of, of refugees and adventurers fighting the Spanish, we are now in sort of the second wave between the 1530s and 1570s, the era of Corsair admirals. People who had real experience, the sort that you couldn't have gained from the palace schools in Istanbul, um, on the ground and are able to employ it, combining their experience as Corsairs with the wealth and power and, and logistical might in particular of the Ottoman Empire. And the same thing very much is going on on the Habsburg side, where people like Andrea Doria and other Corsairs are being hired to work uh, for their interests against the Ottomans. We are, of course, dealing with a period still here, um, a period that continues well into the 19th century, even where states do not have a monopoly on the exercise of force and much military power in general and naval power in particular is contracted. Um, so here in this phase in the Ottoman Empire and the Habsburg Spain are engaged um, in this battle for supremacy in North Africa, the Ottomans in particular, mostly interested in denying that space to the Spanish, less than, I think, controlling it directly, though that could be debated. Um, most famous characters on this end are Kizer Hayreddin Bar Barbarossa um, and his acolyte. Um, in this phase, of course, the Ottomans are successful again and again up until uh, decades after the death of Barbarossa in 1546. Um, the two main setbacks for the Ottomans are first, the attempt to conquer Malta. And this is where we need to kind of step back for a second, recall that the Knights of St. John were based on Rhodes. And after the Ottoman conquest of the Mamluk Sultanate in 1516, 1517, which led to the incorporation of Egypt and Syria into Ottoman domains, the continued existence of this corsairing island right on the main trade routes connecting the two halves north and south of ottoman domains in the eastern half of the mediterranean was intolerable right so the second thing that Suleiman does as sultan is to invade Rhodes and to drive out the knights of saint john and after some time wandering they are given malta an island uh, or a set of islands that is less agriculturally productive than Rhodes was, far smaller, but enjoys deep water ports in a really perfect strategic location. Um, one of Suleiman's last military acts then is to try to conquer Malta in 1565, and that fails um, in the end. And then, of course, quite famously, the Battle of Lepanto in 1571. Um, I don't want to emphasize for you too much the Battle of Lepanto. In many respects, it is not that important, but it does mark the end of kind of an era of large scale galley conflict. Um, that this battle takes place as a consequence of the Ottoman invasion of Cyprus held by Venice. Um, the Ottomans invaded in 1570, and at least one of the reasons they gave was the Venetians' failure to prevent Maltese corsairing in the Eastern Mediterranean. So we see here how corsairing continues to be a thorn in the side of the Ottomans and of the Venetians, um, and begins to drive or at least supply uh, the excuses for warfare and expansion. We will see on multiple occasions, the Knights of St. John and of Catholic corsairs more broadly supplying the Casas Valley for Ottoman wars against Venice. Uh, in the case of the invasion of Crete in 1645, it's a very similar story. Um, now, up until this point, this naval arms race that had take, taken place over the middle decades of the 16th century had been extremely costly to both the Ottomans and the Habsburgs. Um, and ultimately, it, it effectively bankrupts Spain. Um, and it's certainly quite costly to the Ottomans as well. Um, and so within a few years of the Battle of Lepanto, as the Ottomans who are forced to replace the better part of the fleet afterwards, take Tunis, or more precisely take the fortress guarding Tunis from Spain, uh, 
And after that point, we could really call the age of large scale galley conflict over. Um, by the end of the decade, the Ottomans and Habsburg Spain have agreed to a truce, not really to peace, but a truce. And certainly the galleys will still go to sea each year um, to patrol, to fight against pirates, um, to capture men. Uh, but there will never be another galley conflict of the scale of Ponto ever again. And more importantly, and this is again part of the kind of classic narrative, is we see both of these empires turn to other more important, at least for the time beginning, geopolitical concerns. For the Habsburgs, it is the Dutch Revolt. For the Ottomans, it is, it is a really nasty and grinding war with Safavid Iran that begins in 1578, does not end until 1590, and then is followed up almost immediately afterwards with a nasty war with the Habsburgs in Austria and, and Hungary. I let me rephrase the Austrian Habsburgs in Hungary, um, which is known as the Long War, which gives you some idea of how unpleasant it is. And at the very same time, the Ottomans end up combating a massive internal rebellion that begins around 1596, drags on until 1609. This is the famous Chulali Revolt. This is all to say then that the Ottomans and the Habsburgs have their hands full. Um, and this then coincides with phase three of maritime violence in the early modern Mediterranean. And this is really where my book begins. And after 1580, we have an uneasy peace, um, but it's not really peace. That in to this sort of maritime power vacuum, uh, we have Corsair proxies taking a much more prominent role and the arrival of new actors in this Base. On the one hand, we have what uh, Fernand Braudel uh, referred to as the Northern Invasion, the arrival in particular of large numbers of English and Dutch uh, merchants whose ships were better armed and better prepared to uh, engage in both piratical acts and to take control of much of the carrying trade in the Mediterranean, um, which they did with ruthless efficiency over the succeeding half century. Um, and on the other hand, we see the rise in, in particular North Africa, but also in, in, in Malta, of larger numbers of entrepreneurs coming into these spaces to take advantage of the legitimacy and the port infrastructure that they have for Corsari. So that those fighting uh, the Ottomans out of Malta are not simply the Knights of St. John, they are people pulled from across Catholic Europe and even beyond who have come for the opportunity to acquire license to go corsairing. On the same time, is those who wished to continue wars against Spain, but were not permitted to do so, uh, found a friendly home in Algiers and Tunis in particular. So significant numbers of Dutch and English privateers who were put out of work in the first decade of the 17th century find a new home as corsairs in North Africa. Um, this all has a pretty dramatic impact um, on the space that I would refer to as the Ottoman Mediterranean, one which uh, arguably was not getting its uh, due in the literature. And in particular, uh, as I suggested to you earlier, piracy is something that is defined through and by law. Um, and it is something that is made visible to us as historians through and by law. Um, that is to say, is if a ship is captured at sea, everything is taken from it and then it's sunk, we may know nothing more about it and it's lost to sight that the actual pirates of the Mediterranean are usually invisible to the historian. The Corsairs are visible because they had archives. You can go to Malta and visit the archive. They had courts because this is a legitimate activity. Um, so then when we want to find piracy, when we want to talk about piracy, what we are inevitably discussing usually is the aftermath of the piracy. That we can't always often find the pirates or the corsairs for that matter and know all that much about what they were doing. But what we can find are the administrators, the diplomats, the jurists who are arguing about the aftermath, about what came after and about what should be done about it. And that is really what I end up focusing more on. They and the victims are, are really the star of the story. Now, when I talk about the Ottoman Mediterranean, what I really mean 
is this eastern half of the Mediterranean, if you were to imagine, um, we could draw a line from uh, the lower Adriatic across to the western edge of Egypt. Is that is the space that I sort of imagine as the Ottoman Mediterranean here? And it's a space too that the Ottomans will and eventually in the 18th century kind of, kind of come to describe as their maritime territoriality. And this is uh, an argument that Michael Talbot has made very convincingly um, for the 18th century. Um, the reasons why this comes to be the Ottoman Mediterranean and what that actually kind of means are, as I argue, really a function of this space being a legal space. One that's not defined really purely by terms of sovereignty, because of course Ottoman sovereignty extended across North Africa to the borders of Morocco. Um, not by naval supremacy, because the Ottomans really have lost that by the end of the 16th century, um, but by the power in meeting and enforcement of Ottoman law. And as I will suggest to you as we move forward is what that means and where it holds power can sometimes surprise us perhaps a little bit. Um, Let's now zoom in a little bit uh, to Albania. We have towards the end of the 16th and beginning of the 17th, 17th century, an explosion of local piracy. Um, and this is where I can introduce you to the idea of effectively the pirate life cycle, which is something that Mustafa Ali describes to us in the same work where I pulled the quote for you at the very beginning. Um, that piracy, uh, a, a major career in Corsairing even often begins with a man and a few other of his friends forming a small gang with a little boat. Um, and then with time and success, they expand the size of their gang, they expand their range, and only after some amount of time with ever expanding range and ever expanding gang, are they able to acquire a large enough ship and then sail off to go and join the more legitimate uh, operations in places like Algiers or Tunis. At that point, then they can leave behind all the sins of their pirating days when they were attacking the wrong people and devote themselves, de devote themselves to maritime jihad. That is Mustafa Ali's argument of how a lot of the famous Corsair heroes of the first half of the 16th century got their start. And one of the things that he bemoans is that that cycle seems to have been broken towards the end of the 16th century, around the turn of the 17th century. And there is no better example than the one I give you here of this fellow Ahmed at uh, what is now Duras in Albania, who starts off with a small gang. He is always oppressing the inhabitants of the villages in the district, snatching women, girls, and boys, and stealing money and provisions. Then having captured a bunch of locals who are effectively his neighbors, people sometimes have the same faith as he, sometimes others, but neither neither would be legitimately enslaved or captured. All Ottoman subjects are supposed to be free and protected from enslavement. So there's nothing legitimate about his activity here, nothing that would be smiled upon by the authorities of Istanbul, certainly. But having captured these people is then he can employ them to help him build a ship and to help him row it. And now he's able to move on from simply attacking his neighbors to taking advantage of the geography of the space, which is we are at the mouth of the Adriatic. It is the perfect choke point. Every Venetian ship coming or going must pass by Duras. And so you don't have to go very far out to sea to be able to just pop out, snatch these people, come right back into the port. So he built his own frigate, plundering, passing Venetian merchant ships, murdered Muslim and infidel merchants and others on board and stole their property due to the fear of the aforementioned rebel and merchant ships not venture out to sea. Now, what does this tell us, of course, is that A, in part, he must have some local support. Or to have a large enough gang that he's been able to cow the locals into not trying to enforce the law. That for a disadvantaged and now increasingly ignored port like Duris, one which is not enjoying the position in the carrying trade that it once had uh, several decades earlier, the only way for port administrators to really, you know, get enough money to, to survive, and certainly for those who are irregulars built in a base in that port, is to be engaged in maritime raiding of some sort. And somebody like Ahmed here might eventually find his way to uh, serving in Algiers, but he might also stay where he is until eventually authorities might uh, 
build up a desire to do something about it. But characters like Ahmed at this moment, when the Ottomans are engaged on land wars, both against the Safavids and against the Hafsurs, and contending with a massive result in Anatolia, are everywhere. But Ahmed is not the exception. He is the rule in this period, um, quite common. Now, we saw the mention there of Venice is at this point, and between 1573 and 1645, the Ottomans are at peace with Venice. And the commercial treaties that the Ottomans have with Venice contain within, within them quite specific clauses prohibiting both what we would call piracy and enslavement with procedures designed to ensure the return of those wrongfully taken. And so again, what we find, of course, is far more evidence in our sources of things going wrong than things going right. If, if the system is working, there's no documents. Um, occasionally, we do encounter documents saying, thanks for, for you know, doing what you were supposed to do. But more often than not, what we see are evidences of failure. Um, but there is a long history here then of the Ottomans and their diplomatic partners beginning in, in earnest, of course, with the Venetians, but expanding to include the French, the English, the Dutch, uh, dealing with how to regulate maritime violence and how to respond to those incidents that kind of slip through. And if we look then at these sorts of treaties over time, as we can see how the nature of the threat is changing, and we can see how the Ottomans and their treaty partners are trying to deal with those changes. Um, so we can see here then as we, as we read this clause, the ways in which its authors have tried to incorporate both folks who they would consider to be engaged in, I guess, piracy and corsairs who are also themselves engaged in actions that they would not consider to be legitimate. That is to say, raiding Venetian uh, ships and shores in times of peace. What is supposed to be done? Well, they should be found and freed and returned home unless they converted, in which case they're to be found and freed and they should stay. Um, clauses like this have a very long history. Um, but we see here too that these sorts of clauses were meant to be reciprocal. If we go back to this one from 1521, the Venice shall not equip give refuge or provisions to other countries, robber barks. What is a robber bark? It's a pirate, obviously, a robber pirate, but I mean, the word pirate itself, of course, does not exist in, in Turkish. So here we have Harami. Uh, Harami barks and galleys and other ships when they come across the islands and ports and fortresses, and if their capture is possible, they shall capture them, and yada, yada, yada. Um, so this is what we're dealing with then, right? A fairly extensive and explicit set of instructions for you shouldn't outfit these people to attack us, or we shouldn't do it for you. And if they come after you, you can defend yourself, but let us uh, punish them. Um, we see then an idea here too, not dissimilar from the idea of universal jurisdiction to try to capture and defeat pirates. Right, that once one is engaged in activity, they're to be uh, kind of cast out. And that ultimately, the, the, these treaties will also be amended such that um, those who attack Venetians, those Ottoman corsairs who attack Venetians, the Venetians have explicit permission to fight them, to capture them, and to kill them. Um, that, that a carve out is made. But it doesn't always work that way, obviously, because the reality is in, in the period that we're dealing with, the late 16th and 17th centuries, is the Ottomans rely very heavily, especially on their maritime frontier, on unpaid or underpaid irregulars to gather intelligence and to provide security. Um, and the way in which those people then compensate themselves is through raiding. And it's not really a surprise that it would work out that way. So we might turn then to the island of Lefkada, which is the only Ionian island in the Ottomans' possession. All the other ones are held by Venice. And this is the territory which, during the Ottomans' wars with the Venetians, certainly find quite a bit of legitimate plunder to be taken. But as soon as the wars end, 
The same people that they were attacking now are the friends of the Sultan, and what they are doing is frowned upon. It is considered to be effectively piracy, and you routinely have local governors from neighboring districts fighting against these people. Uh, in one case in the 1670s, actually, uh, a governor from a neighboring district sends a force to Lefkada to attack and burn the galleots of the uh, Levens there. Um, Levent being one of the kind of terms for these maritime adventurers who we might translate sometimes as pirates, sometimes as corsair or both. It's obviously a kind of ambiguous term. Um, now, these are people, again, who serve a very important military function, and the Ottomans don't really want them to go away. Better to keep them on their side than not. Uh, but they pose a real challenge in times of peace when they are both attacking Ottoman subjects on the shores and Venetian subjects nearby and taking them captive and employing them as galley slaves or to build their ships. Uh, inevitably, whenever this sort of thing happens is if reports reach Istanbul, as orders are sent to find and free these people, but the reality is there's often no follow-up. And we should probably assume in most instances that not much is done to stop them. Um, but Lefkada in this period, just like Algiers, ends up being this rather cosmopolitan place where people are coming from all over the place within maritime Ottoman domains and ending up there. Increasingly, as the 17th century goes on, working in consort with Corsairs coming up from Algiers and Tunis, and many of them probably hoping that they'll be drafted into the big time and get to work from there, where they will have to worry about far less interference from Istanbul. And this is where I can tell you a story um, of a fellow named um, Mahmoud. Uh, the long and the short of it is the governor of this district that includes uh, Lefkada has a choice to make. Whoever gets this position has to decide whether he's going to try to control the Corsairs based out of Lefkada to employ, make sure they work as Corsairs and actually not as pirates or to work directly with them and to profit from. And in this age in which many Ottoman governors are effectively forced to buy their positions and then to try to extract as much revenue from them as possible before they get rotated out because somebody else has bought the position, uh, the temptation to work with these people is huge. And so we have then a report of an incident in 1617, one which we find out about only after the governor of this district is rotated out, replaced by another one, in which apparently the governor working in a consort with the Levens of uh, Lefkada raided a whole bunch of villages on in his district on land, taking in particular women and children as captives, embarked them on the ships of the Corsairs of Lefkada, and then transported them to somewhere in North Africa, we're not told where. Could be Algiers, could be Tunis, could be one of the shadow slaving ports founded in between the two, which existed only for a time. It popped up and then disappeared. Having exported all these Ottoman subjects, Muslims and Christians, to North Africa, where they were then sold as slaves, his agents purchased legitimately captive captives from the Algerian or Tunisian or whichever corsairs and imported them back again something that I've described elsewhere as effectively being like money laundering, but with slaves. Having taken those who could not be legitimately captured and then dumping them in North Africa as they brought back in a commodity that can be legitimately and openly traded um, and could be rapidly dispersed and sold for cash without danger of it causing lawsuits from those finding themselves in the possession of an illegally enslaved Ottoman subject and suing for their money back, something that actually happened with great regularity in this period. Um, so that gives you an idea then of how the legitimate side of corsairing and the illegitimate piracy could very easily come together. And it tells you too about the fact that already by 1617, the fact that we are dealing with captives of Ottoman subjecthood in these ports in North Africa, is not really a serious concern for them because the reality is by this point is the Ottomans' ability to enforce their decrees in North Africa is decreasing. 
um, increasingly we are dealing with a situation in which the Corsairs based out of North Africa um, can decide for themselves or more precisely their own communities, and their own political leadership can decide for themselves whether they are at war or at peace and with whom, not the Sultan in Istanbul. And that fundamentally shapes what the Ottoman Mediterranean is. Who gets to decide who's at war and who's at peace? Because the question there then is whether a conflict is legitimate jihad or is criminal rebellion. Um, so I'll give you an example of how things have begun to shift here. Um, in 1624, a joint flotilla uh, of course there is based out of Algiers and Tunis commanded by Italian renegades, sacked the customs house of the port of Iskenderun, which is up there in the armpit of the Mediterranean. Iskenderun was in this period the uh, port for the inland trading city of Aleppo. So you had waiting at sea to either load or unload goods, a significant number of English, Dutch, and French ships, as well as a fair number of Venetian ones. And so this flotilla that comes takes a number of prizes in the harbor and then actually lands its troops and burns the Ottoman customs house to the ground, having taken all the cash within it and then sails off. The same people come back again the following year in 1625 and do exactly the same thing again. And the irony here is that the revenues from the Ottoman's customs house at Iskenderun belong to the queen mother, to the mother of the reigning Sultan Kusim. Um, the reigning Sultan at this point is Murad IV. So the Corsairs of Algiers and Tunis have literally just robbed the Sultan's mom. Um, and the reaction across the Mediterranean to this move is really quite dramatic, right? There have been for decades complaints from the ambassadors of Europe at Istanbul about the attacks of the Corsairs of North Africa, and inevitably at every, at every time, decrees would be sent out telling them to stop it. And we could certainly say in many instances, there is a bit of a wink and nod situation here, but not this time. And so we have the observation of Thomas Rowe, who is at the time the English ambassador, saying the pirates of Algiers and Tunis have passed off all obedience to this empire, not only upon the sea where they are masters, but presuming to do many insolences even upon the land. Now, in the same year as that attack on Iskender in 1624, a different group of Corsairs based out of Algiers and Tunis, having made an alliance with some local events in the Bay of Kotor, sack a Venetian town in that region, and then attack the member of the Venetian-held Ionian Islands. And the result of all this are a series of letters and fatwas, as say legal opinions, being sent to Tunis, telling them effectively to cut it out. Um, and it's worth considering for a moment how these things are phrased. So we have a letter from the Ottomans Grand Admiral, the Kapadan Pasha, uh, to Yusuf Day in Tunis, the person who is effectively running Tunis, saying that the Venetians' possessions are not like the possessions of other enemy infidels. Theirs are not permissible for you. These infidels are not like the other infidels. These are not the infidels you're looking for. The ones that you are allowed to attack are the ones that the Sultan tells you you can attack. If the Sultan wishes peace with them, you are not supposed to attack them. And the letter that follows with this, the rest of it goes on to recount the history of all the wonderful things that the Tunisian Corsairs have done in service of the faith and the dynasty. Um, and to laud those who did those things as holy warriors, as mujahids, and as Ghazis, which is a, you know, another one of these very important terms, um, but to describe those who had just carried out this raid against Venice as criminals and rebels and thieves. So a very important distinction. Um, as a consequence of this letter, what happens in Tunis? Do they release the Venetian captives they've taken? They do not. So the ante is up subsequently. Um, more uh, envoys are sent. And they are sent along too with another fatwa, this one of, at this point, 
the newly returned to office uh, Sheikh Islam. This is the chief religious legal authority of the Ottoman Empire, the person who sits atop the entire hierarchy. Um, the authority, the person whose job is ultimately to, you know, to bless or condemn any major act of state. Um, now, I should just give you a brief note here that fatwas of this era, written in Turkish in the style, are always very brief, written with a question that is framed in such a way that the answer can be simply yes or no, most instances. Um, and so the question very simply here, uh, having been stripped of all its detail, and it's done in this way such that it can be reused and uh, reapplied in other situations. And this thought, in addition to existing in this form, sent as a letter by the request of Venice to Tunis, also was preserved in uh, the collections of uh, the fatwas of this Sheikh Islam. This one was meant for the ages. And if you're reading it here, uh, we can see how the exalted uh, phraseology deals with the Sultan and those who work for him, who are all Mujahids and Ghazis, holy warriors, against those who have not asked his permission and attack those with whom he wishes peace. Can you keep them as your captives? The answer is very simply no. Um, well, it doesn't work out that way. Uh, the reality is that um, despite being told that it was not full of all to raid these people, um, being told too that they must be freed, uh, this failed. All efforts to discourage North African corsairs um, in their attacks of certain targets and to hold up the treaties fail. And so we can see then going on in this very same period, which is again a period in which the Ottomans are contending with massive challenges on land and at sea, attacks on both frontiers and with dynastic distress at their core, um, and increasing the diplomatic divergence. That Algiers and Tunis in particular will continue, Tripoli too with them, but Algiers and Tunis in particular will continue to assert the right to determine for themselves with whom they will have peace or war. Um, and what starts to happen then is that the previous attempts that the Ottoman government in Istanbul makes to mediate peace between Algiers and Tunis and their European friends, in particular England and France, but also the Netherlands, um, give way to direct negotiation between negotiations between those powers and the Ottomans. That increasingly uh, we will set aside the Adnames, these commercial treaties decided between uh, the Ottomans and European powers. And while those will continue to exist, we will have for the very first time a true peace treaty, not an agreement, but the actual word treaty will be embraced between the English and Algiers in 1625. Um, followed shortly thereafter by similar treaties with the French and the Dutch. Um, all this takes a pause during the Thirty Years' War and then is renewed again, beginning in earnest uh, in the 1650s. This is how we end up with a situation then, as we look later into the 17th century, where you can have the French and other powers too bombarding Algiers repeatedly um, and then imposing new treaties on them without the Ottomans crying foul. It is not in fact a measure of Ottoman weakness, but rather a measure of the fact that we're talking more about an Ottoman commonwealth in which the North African city-states are members than we are talking about spaces that they administer directly. Now, of course, to make assumptions that the Ottomans deploy power in uniform fashion across the rest of the empire would be entirely false. There's all sorts of different accommodations going on, but the reality here is one in which these spaces are engaged in their own foreign relations with effectively the agreement, the consent of Istanbul after the 1620s. And with the proviso then that their ports are not really Ottoman ports and that the Ottomans will bear no responsibility for what their corsairs are doing. That is to say, in the battle of who gets to decide what is legitimate and legal and therefore what is corsairing, what is piracy, 
is the Ottomans will ultimately concede that they're not in a position to make that decision for them anymore in Algiers or Tunis. And we can see how this plays out even in the space of fiction. Um, and I won't speak for too much longer here um, because I want to leave time for questions. But I want to share this with you because this is a wonderful story that's set in the 1670s, probably written in the 1690s or thereabouts. Um, it is a story of a French corsair ship which takes a number of Muslim captives and then the jailer on the ship decides to stage a mutiny in which he enlists the Muslim prisoners held in the hold of the ship. And so they rise up, overthrow the captain and the other French crew, and then decide that now they will become another type of corsair. Impossible, inconceivable that they would be unaffiliated pirates. They must be affiliated with somebody. So the jailer, who is now the captain, at this point, still by his French name, which we're never told, he later in the story, in the midst of a battle against the Maltese Corsairs, announces to his crew, brothers, my name is Mahmoud. But at this moment, he is still a French Christian. He's saying, we can't go to Istanbul and the Ottomans. They'll take our ship and throw us in jail. Where should we go? Well, Algiers is too greedy. Tripoli is too poor. Let's go to Tunis. Why do they have a Tunisian flag? Because they had previously been attacking and fighting a Tunisian ship. And this gives us a pretty good idea then about the, the kind of religious and political environment of Mediterranean corsairing, where there's a whole bunch of entrepreneurs whose allegiances and alliances are fairly flexible, whose identities are interchangeable, but who still seek, demand, and require recognition and legitimacy from one of the established powers. And that, in this case, the established powers mentioned here are not really the Ottomans anymore. Affiliated, perhaps, but not a part of. So I've made a case here then for the ways in which perhaps North Africa isn't part of the Ottoman Mediterranean anymore by the middle of the 17th century. But we still see strange ways in which Ottoman law ends up finding homes in, in places perhaps where we wouldn't expect it, most notably on Malta itself. Malta being the main clearinghouse for Muslim. Ottoman subject captives in the Mediterranean, whose uh, corsairs, both the knights and those entrepreneurs that they are licensing, are taking Muslim captives routinely back to, to Malta, either to be sold uh, to serve as horsemen or to be held to ransom. Well, in order to be able to get money from Ottoman domains to Malta and to ensure that captives uphold the agreements that they have made in the dungeons, on Malta, you would have to draw up those contracts according to the expectations and requirements of Ottoman law, including the need for Ottoman Muslim witnesses, right? If you wish to be able, as a broker who helps contract these agreements, to ensure that when the person you've just freed pays you when you get back to Istanbul or to Izmir or to wherever they live, you better have a binding contract and it better have been signed up the way we need it. Well, it just so happens in this period of maritime disorder that a whole bunch of Ottoman judges, Qadis, are being captured and taken back to Malta. Large numbers of Qadis um, who know precisely how and as a profession do draw up contracts just of this sort. Um, and we know from administrative documents. We know from one of the only advised, uh, existing uh, Ottoman captivity narratives, th that of the judge, Ajun Juzade Mustafa Avendi, um, and from popular literature from the period, that these sorts of stories were really quite common, that at any given moment towards the end of the 16th and, the, and much of the 17th century, you could probably encounter a fair number of Qadis or professional court scribes or others with a religious legal education sitting on Malta who would be called upon to do their duty in drawing up contracts according to the expectations of Ottoman law precisely so they could be held up in Ottoman courts when those captives came home. Um, so this here, what you're looking at, is an example of a hujat, that is to say a legal document, in this case, having to deal with um, the assignations of legal agency and the transfers of money necessary to ensure repayment of a ransom broker drawn up by a Qadi sitting on Malta. Uh, 
And what we find is in the court records drawn up between by family members and friends who are contracting ransom agents to go and free people from Malta, um, the requirement, the expectation and the demand written out to the letter that a document be obtained from the Cadi of Malta. As if such a person had been appointed to that position rather than simply captured and tossed in the dungeon by chance in order to document the procedure. Now, there's just one fun fact I wanted to note to you, which suggests that at least in some instances, uh, the people on Malta, the captors, probably weren't reading these documents. And that is the fact that you'll see here um, that we are told um, that our captive Saudi, who in the signature at the top identifies himself as a captive on Malta, may God free him, um, is where it's noted that this proceeding is taking place on the island of Malta, may God destroy it. Um, which I always find kind of amusing that the captors and these Catholic agents, not all the agents are Catholic, um, you also have Greek Orthodox, some Jews, all the Muslim agents operating in Malta for uh, Ottomans are, are basically unheard of. Um, there's a certain irony here that these guys are deploying documents to get paid that openly call for their destruction. Um, now the documents you see here uh, exist only in, in this one manuscript that just by chance uh, was preserved because a uh, French consul in Izmir uh, was, as one of his side hustles, engaged in the ransoming of Ottomans from Malta. So he was supplying the money at, at significant interest. And, and that was one way he was making money. So he was, of course, keeping copies of all these documents, and they ended up at the BNF, lucky us. But in fact, if you go to Malta, which I had the pleasure of doing some years ago, um, and go into the registers of the main court of first instance on Malta, you will find instances there of suits on Malta itself between Ottoman captives in the prison and their ransom brokers being brought in to the courts to testify and their documents being used as evidence. Something that is utterly impossible with an Ottoman domains. But here you have Qadis testifying and their, and their documents being supplied. Now I should tell you that of course, many instances in which a, a Catholic were to give his word in that court, uh, he would prevail no matter what the documentary evidence supplied by um, a Muslim plaintiff. Uh, but it gives you an idea then of the ways in which Ottoman law found a home in one of these most inhospitable places, the most reviled spot within the entire Mediterranean for the Ottomans, and yet carried very little weight uh, in North Africa. And so piracy then uh, engenders some strange connections. Um, and its connection with the law is what helps build and at least form the shape of the Ottoman Mediterranean. And so I'll stop there and I'm, I'm eager to hear your questions. Uh, Joshua, that was uh, excellent. Fascinating. Um, a whole subject I, I knew nothing about. Um, does anyone have a, a burning question? Um, uh, if not, I'll, I'll lead with um, something. Um, I, I'm just curious. It, sounded, it sounds like a very entrepreneurial system. And, and I just wonder whether... A bit like with, you know, uh, stimulating the economy in modern times, you know, supporting tech startups, whether governments had a hand in seeding Corsairs, did they finance them? And if they did, did they take a share in the profits? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, absolutely. So absolutely. we can encounter this in two different ways. On the one hand, the ports that are hosting Corsairs, um, as a matter of course, receive a fixed share of, of the booty. Um, it's often 20%, uh, but it could vary. That's true on Malta, that's true in Livorno, that's true in Algiers and Tunis. Um, and in many instances too, uh, the Corsairs might actually be an arm of the government. But I mean, we, we tend to think of things like states and governments as, as these entities that in this period, we're talking about a handful of people where the private interest and the public interest can't easily be separated. 
Um, and where then uh, certainly it is commonplace for the governor of this or that district, whether we're talking about um, the Spanish viceroy in Naples or the Ottoman governor and, and you know, this or that Sanjak on, on, on the coast are using the money that they have at their disposal to finance expeditions, even sometimes to identify targets in advance. That most of this activity is not purely happenstance. It's, I mean, certainly people outfit ships to send them out to sea and we'll see what they find. But often, especially in more constrained spaces like the Adriatic, they know precisely where they're going. And they know precisely what they're planning to capture and they know what they're gonna do with it afterwards. Uh, and so that's extremely common um, to have these individuals who have a public role using their private wealth, which of course has been obtained publicly um, or, or through inheritance or both, uh, to finance things that maybe will burnish their images locally, might upset people further away, might not, especially if you're looking for plausible deniability, which is certainly an issue here. Um, so that's extremely common. And then on the other end of the business, on the ransom side of things, we find again, many of the same people, it's especially common for European consuls and ambassadors to sideline uh, in the ransom industry, um, including those based of course in Algiers and Tunis, uh, but in other cities as well, whether we're talking about ransoming Christians or ransoming Muslims or Jews, um, these people make money that way. Uh, we have evidence, though, of all sorts of people being engaged in this business. We have evidence of, of, of Ottoman princesses loaning money um, at interest to ransom people from Malta. Uh, so this is something that engages huge realms of society and something which is an investment like any other. Corsairing futures is, is something that you can put money in, in which you can make or lose money, um, but in which your personal risk could be quite limited. Right? All the actual Physical risk is borne by a fairly small number of people who will ultimately not make very much money from it, probably. And all the, re I mean, it's, it's capitalism in its purest form. Okay, okay excellent. Thank you. Um, if uh, anyone has a question, raise your hand uh, either in physically or using the Zoom function or use chat. Um, if no one's ready, I'll ask another one. Um, so how in the law, in terms of the eyes of the law, did they differentiate between a pirate and a corsair and determine punishment or freedom? That depends a whole lot on who they attacked because that is oftentimes a, a differentiation that can't be made until after the fact. Now, when we're dealing with kind of local activity, uh, that is to say a handful of guys on a fishing boat raiding their neighbors, there isn't any circumstance in which those people could be thought of as anything other than criminals. And there's, there isn't a word pirate specifically, but are they, Robbers, yes. Are they referred to as criminals? Yes. What will their punishment be if they're captured? Either death or, in many instances, being uh, sentenced to the oar. Um, there's always a need for oarsmen. After the Battle of Lepanto, because so many oarsmen are lost, uh, the, the, the jails are emptied, effectively, and, and any criminal who doesn't merit the death penalty is being sent to row. Uh, so that's how that plays out. Now, of course, if we're dealing with people who actually are already established professional corsairs, what happens? Well, depends on what kind of mission they're on. So certainly we find in the ambiguous circumstances of the late 15th and early 16th centuries, big name corsairs who, when they're kind of off the clock, engage in raids and attacks against those that the Ottomans consider their, to be their friends. And... No punishment is forthcoming because at the time they were not directly in the official employ. Um, so the procedure then is supposed to be that every corsair, just like any contractor today, is supposed to be licensed and bonded. 
So they're supposed to have posted a cash bond in the port out of which they're based from which damage is claimed by another power could be paid out. Did that happen? Sometimes. Did it always happen? Mm -hmm. um, so again, we get to the point that the public and the private can be very difficult to separate and that that ambiguity can be taken advantage of. So the question becomes really one of, well, where did they take the stuff and does anybody know about it? Uh, because you can enforce at least the restitution clauses much more effectively if they're actually operating out of what you control. And so this is one of the main developments of the 17th century, then, is, is this kind of idea of like, well, we, we don't control those places anymore. But if, if they bring them to Ottoman ports, which means not the North African ones, then at least we can arrange for restitution, if not punishment. And from, um, if it, so if I were a, a pirate wishing to become a Corsair, as soon as possible, I would probably want to get some flag of, of uh, convenience, some identity. I mean, I, I, to, so I could argue that I, I am a Corsair, I, yeah, in order to escape uh, the punishment of piracy. I mean, is that a fair sense? And, and I was wondering to what extent did they carry some form of physical uh, uh, allegiance like a flag? when they were out on missions? I mean, once we are talking about people trying to operate within the space of legitimate corsairing, always. If we're talking about, though, people, so when we're talking, for example, about the, the uh, English and Dutch merchants who also sideline in piracy, they'll have plenty of flags that they'll deploy, perhaps to, to scare people, but whenever they have an opportunity to take something, they simply will, and they really won't worry about about how it's going to shake out or look on land later, necessarily. Uh, for those, though, who care about the legitimacy of, of the expedition and who wish to be able to openly sell what they've taken in the markets out of which they're based, is in this starts to matter a great deal. And I'll give you an example. Um, in the mid 18th century, uh, so at this point, we can, we can stay pretty, pretty confidently that the Ottomans have not, in any meaningful sense, controlled, controlled Algiers, Tunis, or Tripoli. In, in over a century. Um, is Tripoli at that time, which I'm in the late 1740s, considers itself to be at war with Venice. The Ottomans, of course, at that point are at peace with Venice, as they often are, um, and are in a much better position to control their own coasts than they were in the 17th century. Uh, so if you are an entrepreneurial, entrepreneurially minded uh, maritime actor, what do you do? But well, we have a whole bunch of cases of people from Crete who sail down to Tripoli, which is not that far away, in order to acquire Tripolitan flags and licenses from the authorities in Tripoli in order to engage in effectively privateering against Venice. And so that clearly matters a great deal to them, that legitimacy. So where does the problem arise? The problem arises if they take Venetian prizes and then bring them to Crete, which is considered fully Ottoman, which they do, in which case the Ottoman authorities say, you can't do that, we're at peace with them, and they confiscate the things and send them back to the Venetians. But the big question becomes not one of, does Tripoli get to be at war with Venice? Or even, uh, do our guys get to go and work for them? I mean, the answer is supposed to be no, don't let Cretans go down to Tripoli and get their flags and attack Venetian targets. But the Bigger issue, the biggest issue becomes one of, if they're going to do this, make sure they don't come back to us. If Tripoli wants to be at war with Venice, fine, but leave us out of it. Um, and so then you see how much it does matter for them to have that flag and for them to follow the rules because Corsairing in the Mediterranean has rules. This is considered to be, by its practitioners, a, a profession that is honorable, in which agreements made are kept, in which the rules of the sea, which go back uh, a good ways, are, are followed, including, for example, if you stop a neutral merchant ship and take a bunch of stuff off it, you're supposed to pay the freight. Right? So you've stolen the property, but it's not the fault of the person carrying it. And so if you're not taking the ship entirely, you're supposed to pay the freight. And so Corsairs who want to be practicing within the legitimate business of Corsairing will follow these rules. Um, and when they break them, which of course many of them do as well, is then we hear about it. Yeah. 
I, I mean, that's fascinating. Um, anyone else want to comment or ask a question? Um, so, um, what was the role of the powers' navies as such? So, yeah, let's say you're know, the Venetians, you want to protect your trade routes. Presumably, you have a professional marine. What what is their mission? You know, if it is to protect it, is it to exterminate pirates or to protect your corsairs? I mean, it, it, did how did they have clear um, rules of engagement and, and missions as the official navies? I mean, certainly, the Venetians did. Uh, they they worked. Uh, tirelessly to defend their routes, to convoy some of the merchant shipping, and to chase down uh, the Corsairs that threatened them. And whereas other powers sometimes would take the Corsairs captive in the rents in the back, the Venetians famously executed those that they found, which of course only made them more enemies in North Africa. Uh, now, the reality, though, is that because Venetians share such a long land border with the Ottomans, is they have real limitations on what they can do to defend themselves without risking upsetting the Ottomans too much. And so they really face an impossible situation. Quite famously, in, in 1638, uh, a, a, a force um, from Algiers and Tunis that had been raiding in the Adriatic gets chased by a Venetian fleet sent to attack them into the port of Vlor in Albania. Um, and the port of Vlor is, is an Ottoman port. And so in theory, if the Ottomans were upholding their agreements, they would not have welcomed in these corsairs who were attacking the Sultan's friends, but they did. And so now they're in the harbor, protected under the guns of its fortress. What did the Venetians do? They camp out for a little while outside the harbor and then decide to force the entrance, fire on the fortress um, and capture or sink the entire uh, North African fleet there, taking one of the ships back as a prize. Well, the Ottomans are really furious um, about this damage done to uh, the port of Lore. They said, these guys had no right to attack you, but you had no right to force the entrance of this harbor when we're at peace, to fire, to destroy the minaret of a mosque, uh, is what they're accused of doing. And the Venetians end up paying an enormous indemnity and returning the ship that they took as a prize. Um, so they're kind of an impossible situation. Um, now, when we're dealing with the Ottoman uh, Navy itself, is the Navy, until the late 17th century, is still predominantly galleys. And in an era in which now the Corsairs based out of North Africa are using more and more uh, ships that look like the one behind me, um, which are far more powerful. And so the Ottomans are, when they go to war, always asking the Corsairs to join them. And they're relying, as I suggested before, on regulars uh, based at various ports on the frontiers for some security intelligence gathering. So it's, again, a fairly impossible situation through much of the 17th century. Um, the Ottoman Navy will depart Istanbul most years and do a little tour of the Aegean collecting taxes and then go back again, except at the times when it's chasing down Cossack pirates in the Black Sea, which is for much of the first half of the 17th century, which gets the Mediterranean basically undefended, except for some of the galley squadrons and the Corsairs. So you have a situation where they're supposed to be relying on these Corsairs for protection, but then... Those Corsairs sometimes attack the people who are coming and bringing customs revenues necessary to pay for the Navy. Uh, so there is a real bit of slippage there, and it's a rather difficult balancing act. Towards the end of the 17th century, um, the Ottomans begin finally to make the transition more and more to sail, and they retrench effectively and become rather more effective at defending their territory. But it is at that point, really more of a defensive navy than it is an offensive navy. That the Venetian, sorry, the Ottoman fleet doesn't sail as far west as even Tunis um, after the first decades of the 17th century. It just stops. 
so effectively they they lost the arms race because they didn't invest in the new technology of uh, men of war powered by sail. For a good, for a good time, yeah, absolutely. I mean, for a time, is is the fleets based out of Algiers were the best of any any in the Mediterranean. It, it, there were there was no other force that was its equal for most of the first half of the seventeenth century. Yeah. Oh, fascinating. Um, I know I sort of hogged the the questions, but it, does anyone else want to uh, jump in? Uh, we've got a few minutes left. Um, no, if not. Um, well, yeah, that was fascinating. I mean, I'd probably go on to discuss more detail, but it really interesting. And uh, and, I, and I suppose I haven't asked enough about the legal side, but I mean, you point out, well, to me, how it seemed to be an established trade, established uh, ecosystem, economic system, uh, governed by laws that, you know, were conflicting in many ways, but but showed or well, showed the conflicts between the parties, um, and you know just fascinating to see how you know the Cardis in Malta kind of had to put their stamp. You know, were still loyal to uh, our, our country of origin, but yeah, we are Cardis, and this is the law. We're doing our professional job. Really fascinating. Um, Thank you so much, uh, uh, Joseph. A really fascinating talk, um, and uh, you know, really uh, look forward to uh, learning more about it. Um, looking at your book, um, how can uh, people get hold of uh, your work? Uh, so you can find it certainly from your favorite online booksellers. Uh, it is available through JSTOR. Um, it is available through DeGrider, and I shouldn't say this because my editor will not like it. People have pirated it. <laughs> okay, uh, that's excellent. And just, uh, I mean, last last question. I mean, what are you working on now? Um, you know, are there any areas where you know any of the audience might be able to contribute? You know, some uh, new sources, ideas. Tell us a little about what you're working on. So presently, I am working on a project relating, it, it ties in a little bit to some of, of what I was talking about. It is on slavery and freedom suits in, in the Ottoman Empire, particularly on, in the 17th century. I mean, this is a period in which uh, slaveholding is not at its greatest extent, but it's still quite high. It's, it's quite widespread. Um, but where the warfare that had once supplied much of the captives consumed by the empire um, has ceased to do so. And so uh, the more regular trades are supplying captives, but so too is the fact that this is a period in which the only thing that determines the legality of, ens of, of enslavement are religion and subjecthood, both of which can be changed or concealed and, and where ethnicity and race may determine to some degree the desirability of a, of a captive, but not the legality of their enslavement. And so what we find then is, is that there's this enormous black market in Ottoman subjects who've been illegally enslaved, tracked across the empire. I mean, there are certainly echoes to the human trafficking that continues to this day in some of these spaces in, in Eastern and Central and Southern Europe. Um, and that these people can and do sue through the courts for their freedom. And the question then of how do you prove you are who you say you are in an era before identity documents or passports um, is a really difficult one. And, 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 and for me, you know, just from the kind of side as a legal and social historian, a really fascinating and, and perfectly painful question to deal with. And the stories are, are truly tragic, but they've basically never been told. Um, so that, that's kind of what I'm working on right now. Yeah. Oh, fascinating. So, you know, what is what is truth in in um, the pre-information age? You know, how do you how do you prove anything? Very difficult. Um, fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, uh, various comments coming in, um, uh, but I really appreciate the time and effort you you've put into this. Uh, thank you also to our audience um, and. Uh, 
I do hope that uh, we will see you again soon. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you.